Good morning, dear students. Today we are going to solve May, June 2014, 1-2 paper. It's an MCQ paper. The syllabus we are studying is Physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar. Let's start today's paper. On your screen, you can see question number one. Each row contains a vector and a scalar. In which row is the size of the vector equal to the size of the scalar? A displacement of a car and speed of the car. You see, displacement and the speed, they both are, uh, the nature of both the quantities is different, so they cannot be same. B part is velocity of a car and distance traveled by the car. The quantities, both the quantity, velocity and distance, they are totally different uh, quantities, so they can never be same. See, velocity of a car, speed of the car. Velocity and the speed, their nature could be same. In some cases, it's possible that the velocity and the speed of the car has the same uh, numerical value, and the nature of the quantity is also the same. If you are moving in a straight line, for example, if you move in a straight line, the velocity of a car and the speed of the car can be same if you move in a straight line. So C can be the answer. D is the weight of a car and the mass of the car. Weight and mass are totally different quantities. So C is the right option. Question number one, C is the right option. Okay, question number two, what is the size of the resultant of the two forces shown in the diagram so here we have two forces one is three newton the other one is four newton and the and the angle between them is 90 degree so complete the parallelogram you see we use the parallelogram law to add the vectors if the vectors to be added their tails are joined together. We can apply the parallelogram law. So complete the parallelogram. Parallel to this four Newton, draw a line here. And parallel to this three Newton, draw a line here. So we will consider these two vectors as the adjacent sides of a parallelogram. And we will complete the parallelogram. So I will draw a four Newton vector here and a three Newton vector here. So I will complete the parallelogram. Then I will join the point where the tails of these two vectors are joined. I will join it with the opposite corner of the parallelogram. The line will be like this. This will be the resultant. This will be the resultant. So this will be four, this will be three. The angle here will be 90. So it will be a right angle triangle with the sides four newton and three newton and its hypotenuse is my resultant so by applying the pythagoras uh, theorem we can find the magnitude of the resultant if this side is four the angle here is 90 and this side is three and this is my resultant which is the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle apply the pythagoras theorem and get the answer. So the Pythagoras theorem says the hypotenuse square is equals to perpendicular square plus base square. So hypotenuse square is equals to four square plus three square. Hypotenuse square will be equals to 16 plus nine. Hypotenuse square is equals to 25. Hypotenuse will be equals to under root 25. Hypotenuse equals to five. So the resultant force is its, its magnitude, its size will be five Newton. I hope that is clear to you. So C is the choice for question number two. C is the choice. Question number three is on your screen. Uh, student measures as accurately as possible the length and internal diameter of a straight glass tube. The length is approximately 25 centimeter and the internal diameter is approximately two centimeter. 
what is the best combination of instruments for the student to use. No, you know, the length is 25 centimeter. The length uh, can be measured easily with a ruler. And because internal diameter is two centimeter, you know, to find the internal diameter of a tube, we normally use a vernier caliper. What we use, vernier caliper. So for internal diameter, I will be using vernier caliper. And for the length, we will be using the ruler. So it looks D is the choice. Question number three, D is the choice. Okay, question number four is on your screen. An object falls from rest to the air. Its velocity increases until it reaches terminal velocity. Which quantity increases until its terminal velocity is reached? You know, when your velocity is increasing, uh, the air resistance that also increases. The air resistance depends upon how fast you are moving. So if your velocity is increasing, the another quantity which is definitely increasing is the air resistance. So out of the given four option, air resistance looks the best option. So for I think that for question number four, B is the best option. For question number four, B is the best option, air resistance. The question number five is on your screen. Uh, the diagram shows a block of stone on a rough horizontal surface. Force P X on the block as shown. The block is at rest. A frictional force acts on the block. Which row shows the direction and the size of the F? The block is not moving. So the frictional force will be equal to the P and it will be opposite to P. So because the P is acting towards the right, the frictional force should be acting towards the left. And its size should be same as the P. So to the left, direction of F, to the left, and the size of F, same as P. So C looks the right option. For question number five, C is the right option. For question five, C is the right option. The direction of the force F is to the left and its size is equal to the size of P. Question number six is on your screen. The distance traveled by a car is increasing uniformly as it is driven along a straight road up a hill. So here we have a distance time graph on the y-axis distance is represented and on the x-axis time is represented the graph is a straight inclined line with constant slope constant gradient the gradient of the distance time graph is equals to the speed because in this graph the dis uh, the, the gradient is constant it means that the speed is constant another very important um, quantity which depends upon the speed of an object is the kinetic energy because the speed throughout here is constant it means that the kinetic energy is constant and at the start of the experiment there was certain speed which remained constant throughout it means uh, the body has some kinetic energy and that kinetic energy remained constant. Kinetic energy, you know, the formula is one by two mv square, half mv square. So if the speed is constant, it means the kinetic energy is constant. And throughout this observation, the body was moving at the constant speed. It, it means that throughout this experiment or this observation, the body had certain kinetic energy and that remained constant. The question is, which quantity for the car is constant but not zero? Acceleration, there is no acceleration. The, the speed is not changing. The gravitational potential energy, we don't know about the height of the car. 
uh, whether it uh, the, the, the car is gaining height or it's not gaining height. Okay, the distance traveled by a car is increasing uniformly as you drive along a straight road up a hill. Oh, it's gaining. So, <clears throat> so but there it is. It is gaining height. The, the road is going up a hill. It's gaining height. It's, the gravitational potential energy is is changing, but it's not constant. You know, as you move up the hill, what will happen? Your potential, gravitational potential energy will increase. The kinetic energy is definitely constant. Resultant force, we don't know about that. Uh, because the body is moving at a constant speed, we can say the constant. The resultant force uh, is zero. So it's, it, 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 it is zero. He said find a quantity which is constant, but it is not zero. So the only quantity which is constant and is not zero is kinetic energy. So C is the right option, sir. C is the right option. Kinetic energy due to this observation remained constant. Question number six C is the option. Question number seven is on your screen. Four rocks up on different planets have masses and weights as shown. Which planet has the greatest gravitational field strength here? Four options are given. And in the each option, you know, um, the weight is given and the mass is given. So if the weight and mass is given, we can find the gravitational field strength. The formula, you know, the formula for the weight is W equals to mg. And if you make the G subject of the formula, G is equals to W divided M. So for each given option, get the value of the G. So for option A, W divided by M. For option B, W divided by M. For option C, W divided by C. For option D, W divided by M. Uh, M and get the value of the G for all of them and then see which one has the greatest value of the G. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my paper. Question number seven is on your screen. For all the A, B, C, and D options, you can see that I have calculated the value of the G. I have used the W and M value given in the data. And we have found that the greatest value of the G is in the B option, 8 Newton per kg. So for question number uh, 7, B looks the option, sir. Right option is B. It has the greatest G value, 8 Newton per kg. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, so the B is the option for question number 7. Okay, on your screen, you can see question number eight. A stone has a mass of 390 gram and a density of 2.7 gram per centimeter cube. Cooking oil has a density of 0 0.90 gram per centimeter cube. Which mass of oil has the same volume as the stone? So in this question, you know, there are two. He's talking about two different things. One is the stone and the other thing is the cooking oil. So the stone, we have the mass of the stone, we have the density of the stone. So we can calculate what is the volume of the stone. You know the formula is density is equal to mass divided by volume. And volume is equal to mass divided density. Volume equal mass by density. So mass is 390 gram of the stone and the density is 2.7. So what you will do, you will divide the 390 gram with 2.7 grams per centimeter cube, and you will get the answer 144.44 centimeter cube. So that is the volume of the stone. He said the volume of the cooking oil and the volume of the stone is same. So I calculated the volume of the stone, and according to the story given in the question, the volume of the cooking oil is equals to the volume of the stone. So the volume of the cooking oil is also 144.4 centimeter cube. The density of the cooking oil is given. That's 0 0.90 gram per centimeter cube. So now I can find the mass of the oil also. You know, the formula for density is mass divided by volume. And if I make M the subject, the mass, the subject of the formula, 
So M will be equals to density multiplied volume. Density of the oil is 0 0.90 gram per centimeter cube multiply with the volume. And volume of the cooking oil is 144.44 centimeter cube. So multiply them and you will get the answer 130 gram. The answer will be 130 gram. The mass of the oil will be 130 gram. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work also so it becomes easy for you. Here you see first I calculated the volume of the stone, the density and the mass were given. It came out to be 144.44 centimeter cube. In the story he told us that the volume of the cooking oil and the volume of the stone is the same. So, and the density of this, uh, the cooking oil was also given. The volume of the cooking oil is equal to 144.44 centimeter cube. Then I calculated mass of the cooking oil, density multiply volume 0 0.90 multiply 144.44, and the answer is 130 gram. 130 gram. So if we, if we look at the options, 130 gram question number eight a is the option 130 gram question number eight a is the option i hope that is clear to you how we have done this okay here we go question number nine a beam of length 40 centimeter is pivoted at one end the weight of the beam is four newton and acts at a point 20 centimeter from the pivot a two Newton weight hangs 10 centimeter from the pivot. An upward force U is needed to keep the beam horizontal. What is the size of the force U? Okay, here we have the pivot. Here we have one force of two Newton. It's perpendicular distance from the pivot is 10 centimeter. Then we have this force, four Newton. It's perpendicular distance from the pivot is 20 centimeter. Here we have another force U. Its perpendicular distance from the pivot is 40 centimeter. If you pay attention, you will know that these two forces, 2 Newton and 4 Newton, they are trying to produce a clockwise moment about the pivot. And this force U is trying to produce an anti clockwise moment, anti clockwise moment about the pivot. According to the principle of moments, the sum of the uh, clockwise moments should be equals to the sum of the anti-clockwise moment. So we will have uh, anti-clockwise moment equals to the clockwise moment and we will have u multiply 40 equals to 2 multiply 10 plus 4 multiply 10. And you know from there you can do the calculation. I've done this on a paper. I hope that this diagram is clear to you. Let me show you my working. I've done this on a paper. Okay, so here we go. Clockwise moment is equals to anti-clockwise moment. Clockwise moment, there were two forces trying to produce the clockwise moment. Two into 10 plus four into 20 equals to U into 40. So 100 is equals to U into 40. So U is equals to 100 divided by 40 and U is equals to 2.5 Newton. So the magnitude of the U force is 2.5 Newton. Let's go back to the work. So the answer is 2.5 Newton. So the C is the option. For question number nine, C is the option. 2.5 Newton, question number nine, C is the right option, sir. Okay, so on your screen, we have question number 10. A man uses clay to make a pot. He washed the pot to be as stable as possible when placed on a flat surface. Which two features of the pot must be must the man consider? You know, if you want anything to be very stable, the base area should be large and the center of mass should be as low as possible. So the area of the base should be large and the height of the center of the gravity of center of the mass, it should be low. So these are the two factors that when you are making a pot and you want it to be very stable, you should be considering these two, uh, these two features. So the A option is the area of the base and the height of the center of the gravity. That is the right option, sir. 
B is the density of the clay and the area of the base. No, the density of the clay and the height of the center of the gravity. No, the weight of and the height of the center of the gravity. No. So A is the best given option. The area of the base and the height of the center of the gravity. For question number 10, A is the right option. Question number 10, A is the right option. Okay, on your screen we have question number 11. A force is applied to a body. Which property of the body cannot be changed by the force? When you apply the force, the shape of the body can be changed. When you apply the force, we can change the length, width, height, thickness, size, radius. We can change its size. When we apply the force, the velocity can be increased, the velocity can be decreased. So shape, size, and velocity, when we apply force, we can change that. But the one thing which we cannot change by applying the force is the mass of the body. So the right option is A, it's mass. We cannot change it by applying force. Question number 11, A is the right option. Question number 12, the graph shows the extension of a piece of copper wire as the load on it is increased. What does the graph show? You know, this is extension and this is the load. And till this point, the extension and load graph is uh, a straight line. And after that, it became a uh, increasing curve. This means that uh, till this point, the extension and the load, they are directly proportional to each other. But after this, even if you increase a minor, if you increase uh, a small amount of load, the extension will be larger. So it means that after a certain load, it becomes very easy to extend the wire. At a certain load, the wire becomes easier to extend. So A looks the right option, sir. What does the graph show? At a certain load, the wire becomes easier to extend. At a certain load, the wire becomes harder to extend. The C and the, law, the load and extension are directly proportional for all loads. The load and extension are inversely proportional for all loads. So A is the best option, the best statement given here. At a certain load, the wire becomes easier to extend. So A is the choice. Question number 12, A is the right choice. Okay, my dear students, uh, question number 13 is on your screen. The diagram shows a manometer containing mercury that is sealed at one end. What happens to the distance h when the manometer is taken uh, to the top of a mountain? When you go to the top of the mountain, the atmospheric pressure will decrease. You know the difference of levels in both the limbs, which is represented here in the diagram with h, that shows the difference of the pressure uh, between the vacuum and the atmosphere. When you will go to the top of the mountain, the difference of the pressure between the vacuum and the atmosphere will decrease because at the top of the mountain, the atmospheric pressure is less. So when you go on the top of the mountain, the atmospheric pressure will be less. The difference of the pressure between the vacuum and the atmosphere will also become less. So this H value should decrease. The H value should decrease because the atmospheric pressure decreases with height. So A looks the right option, So It decreases because atmospheric pressure decreases with height. Question number 13, A is the right option. Question number 13, A is the right option. The value of the H will decrease because as you go on to the higher levels, uh, you gain height, the atmospheric pressure decreases. Here we have a question. Let me reduce the size so you can see all the options. Which graph shows the total external pressure acting on a submarine at different depths below the surface of the sea? You know, when you are under the, under the, I mean, uh, under the water, uh, you are acted by two pressures. One is atmospheric pressure, which is always all the time acting on you. And the other pressure is due to the pressure, water pressure. The, as you go deeper, the pressure of the water will go increasing. The formula for the pressure of the water is 
P is equals to rho GH. P is equals to rho GH, where H is means the depth of the water. So the depth and the pressure of the water, they have a linear relation with each other. So the graph should be a linear. It should be a linear, a linear, a line should be linear. But you know, when you come to the surface of the ocean, when submarine comes to the surface of the ocean, there is no depth of the water then. The water above the submarine is becomes zero when you come to the surface, when the submarine comes to the surface of the water. But the atmospheric pressure is still there. So when the depth is zero, the pressure on the submarine do not become zero because the atmospheric pressure is still acting on it. So the graph should be a straight line, but at zero depth, there should be some pressure. So B is the right option. I hope that you have understood my explanation. So B is the right option for question number 14. Okay, question number 15 is on your screen. A gas occupies a volume of two meter cube in a cylinder at a pressure of 240 kilopascal. A piston compresses the gas until the volume is 0 0.50 meter cube. The temperature remaining constant, underline this thing, temperature remain constant. You know, if we are talking about the pressure of a gas and the temperature is constant, we can apply the formula P1, V1, equals to P2 V2. The P1 is given, that's 240 kilopascal, and the V1 is given, that's two meter cube, and the pressure number two is a question, and the volume two is 0 0.50 meter cube. Just apply the formula, do the calculation, get the value of the P2. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Are you obvious visible to you? P1, V1 equals to P2, V2, when the temperature of the gas remain constant. 2 into 240 equals to P into 0 0.50, so P is equal to 960 kilopascal. 960 kilopascal. So question number 13, nine kilo, 960 kilopascal. 960 kilopascal is the D choice. 960 kilopascal is the D choice. So D is the right option. Question number 15, D is the right option, dear students. Okay, question number 16 is on your screen. Which source releases carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, when generating electricity? So, you know, in, especially in Pakistan, we are using the fossil fuels and we are burning those fossil fuels and we are producing electricity. So when those fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is given out, and that is the greenhouse gas, and that causes global warming. So geothermal, no. Hydroelectric, no. Nuclear, no. Fossil fuel is that way of generating electricity in which the carbon dioxide is given out, which is a greenhouse gas. So A is the right option. Question number 16, A is the right option. Question number six, 17 is on your screen. Where is energy released by the fusion of hydrogen nuclei to form helium? You know, on the sun and on the other stars, we have learned in our syllabus that uh, on the sun and on the other stars, what happens? We, for example, for very simple, we have two small hydrogen nuke atoms. And what we do, uh, those two small hydrogen atoms, they come close to each other at a very high pressure and temperature. And those hydrogen atoms, their nuclei fuse with each other and they make a big, big nucleus of helium. So small nuclei join together, fuse together to make a large nuclei and we call that process fusion. And that is taking place on the stars and on the sun. So where is the energy released by the fusion of hydrogen nuclei to form helium? In the core of the sun. D is the right option. So question number 17. D is the right option. This is happening. The fusion is happening in the core of the sun. 
Question 18 is on your screen. A crane lifts a load of 66,000 Newton through a vertical distance of 15 meter in 30 seconds. What is the average useful power during this operation? You know, if you want to calculate power, the formula is work done divided by time taken to do that work. Power formula is work done divided by the time taken to do that work. So work done in this case, we can calculate work done is equals to weight multiply the vertical height. Weight multiply with the vertical height. That will give you the work done. And once you have the work done, then divide it with the time taken. And that will give you the power. You know the how much power is used. Now I have done this on a paper. Let me show you the paper. Okay, so question number 18 is on your screen. I hope you can see that. Power is equals to work done divided by time. So power is equals to weight multiply height, the vertical height you the slabs gain divided by time. So 6000 multiply 15 divided by 30, and the answer is. 3000 watt so the useful power is 3000 watt i hope that you have understood this calculation uh, 3000 watts so c is the option 3000 watt c is the right option a famous question is on your screen this type of questions in which the length of the mercury and the temperature uh, they are involved. This is a famous concept on which sometimes numericals come in the paper. The diagram shows a liquid in glass thermometer. You see, when the temperature is zero, the length of the thread is two centimeter. We call it L naught. Means that the length of the mercury thread when the temperature is zero. When the temperature is hundred, the length of the thread is twenty. He says, uh, at zero degree centigrade, the length of the liquid column is two centimeter. At 100 degree centigrade, the length of the liquid column is 22 centimeter. What is the length of the liquid column at 40 degrees centigrade? So when the temperature will be 40, what will be the length? So let me show you my work and I will explain it also to you. Okay, so there we go. This is the... Uh, work I have done, I hope is clear and visible to you. It's a famous formula, sir. L theta minus L naught divided by L hundred minus L naught is equals to theta minus zero divided by hundred minus zero. L theta, we want to find the length when the temperature is 40 minus L naught is two centimeter divided by L hundred. L hundred is 22 minus L naught minus two equals to 40 divided by the theta on which we want to find the temperature is, is uh, 40 and divided by 100 and x minus 2 divided by 20 equals to 40 divided by 10 and x minus 2 is equals to 8 and x is equals to 8 plus 2 and x is equals to 10. So the length of the mercury column will be 10. The length of the mercury column will be 10 centimeter. Question number 19, 10 centimeter is the answer. So D is the right option, sir. For question number 19, D is the right option. Question number 19, D is the right option. Okay. So on your screen, you can see we have question number 20. A thermometer is used to measure a term temperature of 80 degrees centigrade. Which thermometer is most sensitive? They have the same length, all these four thermometers, they have the same length. It looks they all have the same diameter of the bore. It looks the size of the bulb is same. The amount of mercury also looks the same. Which one is the more, in this case, when everything is identical, the, the most sensitive thermometer will be that thermometer whose range is least whose range is least. So let's say for the first thermometer from minus 40 to 160. So its range is like 200 degrees centigrade. The second thermometer is from 50 to 150. Its range is 100. The, the C part, 
20 to 170 its range is 150 and the third d d option 0 to 200 its range is 200 so the most sensitive thermometer is that thermometer whose uh, uh, range is least and that is b its range was 100 it has the least range in all these four given options so the least rain thermometer will have the it will be the most sensitive thermometer so b is the right option sir question number 20 b is the right option okay here we have another question question number 21 on your screen the diagram shows a flask containing air the air is trapped by a drop of oil in a narrow tube. So this flask has air in it. And here we have a narrow tube. And in this narrow tube, we have put an oil drop. So what will happen if we will increase the temperature of this air, this oil drop will move upward. If I will decrease the temperature of this air, this oil droplet will come down. You know, this thing can be used as a thermometer as well. He says, when the flask is heated, the oil drop rises up the tube, which statement is not correct. The air molecules each get larger. You know, the molecules never get larger. When you heat them, they don't get larger. They molecule, the molecules move away from each other. They don't get larger. B is the air molecules hit the container with greater force. Yeah, that's possible because, you know, when they are given heat so they are moving faster so they will be exerting more force when they hit the walls of the flask the air molecules move faster that's definitely happening there the air molecules move faster d is the air molecules move further apart yeah that is also true the air molecules move further apart now, which statement is not correct? That is the question. It's a very tricky thing. You know, he's asking which statement is not correct. He's not asking which statement are correct. He's asking which statement is not correct. The first, and the first statement, the air molecules each get larger. That's the wrong statement. So that is not correct. So A is the answer. It's a very tricky question. He's playing with your mind. The air molecules get larger, that's the wrong statement. So he was asking us to pick up the, that statement, which is wrong. So A is the option. Question number 21, A is the option. Okay. Question number 22 is on your screen. The thermal energy is transferred to a solid. First it melts and then it boils to produce a gas. Which statement about the temperature is correct? You know, when the, when the state change takes place, when the state change takes place, whether it is boiling or it is uh, melting or whether it is uh, solidifying or whether it is condensing, whenever the state change takes place, the temperature do not change during that process. That's our theory. The temperature do not change when the state change is taking place, okay? When the temperature is rising, when the temperature is dropping, uh, that's a different case. But when the temperature is, uh, when the state is changing, the temperature will not change. He said, which statement about the temperature is correct? When melting and boiling, the temperature does not change. That's true. That's true. That's 100% true. When melting and boiling, the temperature increases. That's wrong. When melting, the temperature increases. But when boiling, the temperature stays the same. That's wrong. When melting, the temperature stays the same. But when boiling, the temperature increases. That's also wrong. So the only right option given is the first one. When melting and boiling, the temperature does not change. So e, A is the option, sir. A is the right option for question number 22. Question number 22A is the option. Question number 23 is on your screen. Steam at 100 degrees centigrade is passed into some water in a beaker. A 
all the steam condenses in the water. The mass of water in the beaker rises from 120 grams to 122 grams. The specific latent heat of vaporization of water is 2250 joules per gram. How much thermal energy is lost by the steam as it condenses? You'll see, first of all, the temperature will not change. The temperature remains the same. So when you have 100, uh, you have 120 gram of water and you inserted steam into it and the mass of the water raised from 120 gram to 122 gram. That's, this means that uh, 122 minus 120, the answer is two grams. So it means that two grams of steam has converted, has condensed into the water. So the mass of the steam which converted into water is two grams. The specific latent heat of vaporization of water is 2,250 joules per gram. And he wants us to calculate how much thermal energy is lost by the steam when it condenses. So we can apply the formula. We know the formula is heat is equals to ml. Formula is heat equals to ml. If you want to calculate the heat which was lost during the condensation, formula is heat is equals to m multiply l, where m is the mass and l is the latent specific latent heat of vaporization. So if you put the formula, you have put in the values, you can get the answer. Let me show you my working. I have done this on a paper here. Question number 23, hopefully is visible to you. Heat is equals to ml. Two multiplied 2,250. Answer is 4,500. So it can be written as 4.5 expo 3 joules. 4.5 expo 3 joules is the right answer, sir. Let me see which option this is. 4.5 expo 3 joules. It looks the C is the option. Question number 23, C is the right option. Okay, we have to reduce the size a little bit. And question number. Uh, okay, let's reduce the size. A uh, hot liquid is poured into a beaker. So we have a liquid which is very hot. The graph shows how the temperature of the liquid changes as it cools towards room temperature. So it's a cooling curve here. Right? The time is increasing. It's on the x-axis. Here we have the temperature. As the time passes by, the hot liquid temperature is dropping and this cooling curve we have got. What is occurring at the region X? So at the region X, you know that the cooling curve has become flat. It was a hot liquid before, and then the cooling curve becomes flat, and then again, the cooling curve starts going down, you see? So what is probably happening X, at X? You know, when a state change will take place, the temperature curve will become flat. The temperature will not change when there is a state change taking place. So we think that, the, the hot liquid at the point X has started converting into solids. So solidification is taking place at point X. And you know the evaporation all the time continues. So we can say the solidification and evaporation is occurring at the point X. So D is the best option given. D is the right option. Question number 24, D looks the right option, sir. Question number 24. D is the right option. Okay. Question number 25 is on your screen. What is the frequency of a wave? The frequency is the number of waves passing from a point in one second. A option is the number of waves passing a fixed point per second. That is the right definition. Okay. So A is the option. Question number 25A. Is the option so very easy? You can read the next option. They are not correct. Question number 26 is on the screen. The diagram shows two divergent rays of light from an object O being reflected from a plane mirror. At which position is the image formed? Okay. So here is the object, one ray goes direct to the mirror and makes 90 degree angle with the mirror and comes back. Another makes a certain angle here and is reflected this way. 
if you want to locate the image the same method is very simple try to follow my instruction if you have a hard copy in front of you please take a scale and draw as i'm saying and uh, follow the instructions you can you can prolong this this prolong this behind the mirror and prolong this reflector ray behind the mirror with a straight line so where these two prolonged rays will intersect there the image will be located and probably it will be located at point b so b is the right option you have to actually draw on your paper to locate the image the prolong the both the rays this ray prolong it behind the mirror with a straight line with the help of a scale prolong this reflected ray behind the mirror with the help of a scale draw these two rays with the dotted lines where these two prolonged rays will intersect there will be the image located so it will be most probably at the position b so b is the right option i hope that you have understood it question number 27 is on your screen which statement is correct for all electromagnetic waves all electromagnetic waves the transverse wave all electromagnetic waves travel with the speed of light uh, they are they are transverse wave that's right they cannot travel in a vacuum that's wrong they have the same frequency that's wrong they travel through through lead they can uh, but for all of them some of them might some of them might not they are transverse that is a hundred percent property of all the electromagnetic waves i hope you have understood so a is the option question number 27 a is the right option question number 28 is on your screen which frequency is is in the ultrasound range the ultrasound range uh, you know the ultrasounds are those sound waves whose frequency is more than 20000 hertz so which of them is more than 20000 hertz this d part 35000 so it is ultrasound d is the right option question number 28 d is the right option uh, the ultrasounds are the sound waves whose frequency is more than 20000 hertz d is the right option question 29 in an experiment to determine the speed of sound in air a student stands 200 meter away from a cliff and claps two pieces of wood together his classmates standing next to him start stopwatches when the two pieces of wood meet and stop the stopwatches when they hear the echo. Their times are 1.44 second, 1.70 second, 1.58 second, 1.76 second. Which value for the speed of sound do they obtain? Okay, first of all, he did that experiment four times and he got the times on the stopwatch. The four times are given we will find the average time so we will add up all these four values of the time and we will divide it with four so then you will get the average time taken for the wave to travel and once you have that average time then you know the distance the wave travel you know the distance moved from where you clapped the two wooden pieces and from there it went to the cliff and then it came back so 200 meter in going and 200 meter in coming back so the total distance traveled by the echo is 200 plus 200 it will be 400 meter so you can find the speed of the sound by applying the formula distance divided by time so the distance will be 400 meter and the, whatever the average time you will get divided with that and you will get the speed i've done this on a paper let me show you my work I hope that this is visible to two. So the average time will be 1.62 seconds. And the distance traveled is 400 and the average time taken is 1.62. So the sound, the speed of the echo or the speed of the sound is 247 meter per second. 247 meter per second. 247 meter per second. 247 meter per second is the C choice. Question number 29, C is the right choice, sir. Question number 30 is on your screen. What always produce a permanent bar magnet? You can produce the permanent bar magnet if you have the steel bars and you put them in a coil and you connect that coil 
with the DC power supply. This is in your book. This is in your textbook, physics, matter. This experiment is given there. You have a steel ball. You, you wound a coil uh, around it and you connect that coil with a DC power supply and that steel rod will become permanent magnet. So what always produces a permanent bar magnet? Steel and DC current. A steel bar in a coil carrying direct current, D is the right option. D, a steel bar in a coil carrying direct current, D is the right option for question number 30. Question 31, which row shows an electrical conductor and an insulator? Electrical conductor, most probably it will be a metal and insulator will be some kind of uh, wood or rubber. So electrical conductor, aluminum and the insulator rubber that's the best option a looks the right option question number 31 a question number 31 electrical conductor he says which row which row shows an electrical conductor and an insulator so question number 31 a is the right option sir a is the right option Okay, let me reduce the size so you can see the whole of the thing. 32, question 32 is on your screen. A metal sphere is connected to earth. A positively charged rod approaches the sphere and drops before touching it. And stops before touching it, sorry. Uh, a metal sphere is connecting connected to earth a positively charged rod approaches the sphere and stops before touching it what is the movement of charge on the sphere and what is the final charge on the sphere you know this metal sphere it is connected to the earth to earth wire when you bring this positive charge near here the this is basically neutral so the electrons of the metal sphere, the free electrons will be attracted to this positively charged rod. So electrons will accumulate here. On this side, the negative, uh, on this side, the negative will appear and this side will become positive. To neutralize this positive, the electrons from the earth will come and they will neutralize this. So on this metal sphere, the balance is disturbed. There will be a lot of, unbalanced electrons so it will become negative so the electrons negative charges have moved from earth to the sphere and the sphere finally will become a negative so it looks say is the choice question number 32a is the right choice electrons will flow from the earth and the sphere will finally become a negatively charged Okay. <coughs> Sorry. An appliance uses a current of 3 amp. Which row is correct for the fuse in the appliance? You know, the fuse must be little higher than the, the current which the appliance takes. So if the appliance is taking like 3 amperes, the, the rating of the fuse can be 4 amperes, it could be 5 amperes. And the fuse is always connected in the live wire. The fuse is always connected in a live wire. So B looks the right option. Question number 33, or B is the right option, sir. Question number 34 is on your screen. Which device uses the force experienced by a current in a magnetic field when in normal use? You know, the two things. We provide current them and they produce motion. Two things. They have a coil which is in a magnetic field. The coil is like a conductor in a magnetic field. And when the current is passed through that coil, they, the coil starts vibrating. The thing starts vibrating. So this is happening in the DC motor and it is also happening in the loudspeaker. The DC motor is not given here. So the loudspeaker is the device which uses a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field experiencing a force. Loudspeaker. Question number 34 C is the option, sir. Okay. 
a relay is used in a circuit containing a bell. I remember this diagram. This diagram will help you in a theory paper also. A relay is used in a circuit containing a bell. How can the apparatus be altered to make the sound of the bell louder? You know, the bell is getting its electric power from Q, the battery Q. If you want the bell to be sound louder, increase the number of cells here, increase the power of the battery. Simple. Increase the voltage of the battery. The real, the exact word should be. Uh, so C is the option, increase the voltage of the battery. Q is a simple question. So don't get confused here. So question number 35, C is the option. Okay. Question 36. As a magnet is moved into the coil of a wire, as shown, there is a small reading on the sensitive ammeter. Which change increase the size of the reading? Keeps on the, the size of that reading to be increased. Means a larger amount of current it should be induced, a larger EMF should be induced. That can be obtained by three things. You increase the number of turns per unit length in the coil. You use a magnet which is a stronger magnet. And the third is you move the magnet faster. So which one is given here? Let's see. We change increase the size of the reading. First is moving the opposite pole into the coil. That will not help. Pulling the magnet out from the coil. That will also not help. Pushing the magnet in faster. Yes, that's the thing. Uh, unwinding some of the turns of the wire. That's totally opposite. So C is the right option, sir. Pushing the magnet in faster. C is the right option. That will increase the reading on the ammeter, pushing the magnet in faster. Okay, question 37 is on your screen. What are emitted by the hot filament inside a cathode ray tube? We have hot filament in the cathode ray oscilloscope and that is the process is called thermonic emission and electrons are given out. By the thermonic emission, electrons are given out. So C looks the good option, sir. 37 C is the right option. Electrons are given out in the process of thermonic emission from a hot filament in the cathode ray oscilloscope or cathode ray tube. C is the right option. Okay, on your screen, we have uh, a table, 38 question. The table contains parts of the color code of resistors. The black color means zero, brown color means one, and red color means two. What is the resistance of the resistor with the color band shown? Okay, remember this thing. These color bands are used in the, on, in the resistors to tell you how much is the resistance of this resistor. So to decode them, remember one thing. What I'm saying, kindly note that. The first band is the digit. The second band is also used as a digit. And the third band is used as a multiplier. Okay, so for example, I take red. Red is two, so note down two. Black is zero, so note down zero. So the digit becomes 20. So the number is 20. This is a multiplier. Multiply 10 raised to power brown. Brown is one. 10 raised power 1. So 22 multiply 10 raised to power 1. 22 multi, uh, 20 multiply sorry, 20 multiply 10 raised to power 1. So 20 multiplied 10 is 200. So 200 is the answer. So you see, the first color, the first color on the band is a digit. The second color on the band is a digit. And the third color of the band tells you how much will be the multiplier. Multiplier is 10 raised to power what, okay? So for example, red here, that's two. Black here is zero, so 20. Then the third color, multiply 10 raised to power what? Brown, brown is one, so 10 power one. So 20 multiply 10 raised to power one, and 20 multiply 10, and this answer will be 200 ohm. So the resistance is 200 ohm. I hope that if you have read this topic, this was not, a, this topic was not in the, physics matter but you can find this topic in other books and if you have done few questions on this so and it will be clear to you i have also tried my best to make clear uh, make this topic clear 
I hope you have understood. Just 200 ohm is the answer. B is the option, sir. 38B is the option. On your screen, we have question number 39, which row states the nature and range of beta particles in air? You know, the beta particles in nature, they are beta particles in nature. They are electrons. They have negative charge on them and they are like electrons. Beta particles are electrons and they can go to uh, several from, I mean, few meters. So their can, range can be from 10 to 10 centim, 100 centimeters, sorry. Their range can be from 10 to 100 centimeters. Question number 39D is the right option. 10 to 100 centimeters. Beta particle. D is the option. Question number 40 is on your screen. Which particle has the smallest mass? Alpha particle, they have, they have two protons and two neutrons. So their mass is quite heavy. Electrons, electrons, yes, it's very light. Electrons, neutron, neutron mass is like a mass of a proton and proton, proton has mass. So the lightest of them is the smallest mass. Electron has the smallest mass. So B is the option, question number 40. B is the right option. Question number 40, B is the option. Electron has the smallest mass. By this question, we have reached the end of the paper. This was, okay, everybody, thank you very much. Today we have done May, June, 2014, one, two paper. It's an MCQ paper. And the syllabus we are studying is physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar and I hope that this video is um, some help to you. And I want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Keep studying hard. Your grades will improve. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you all.